Good evening. Good evening. I'm Dr. Joseph Caruso. I am a board certified orthopedic surgeon and I am certified medical plasty joint replacement. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay. No? I'll try to speak up a little. Anyway, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the technology at first. Um, and Dr. Williams is going to talk a little bit about patient benefits. And we're going to give you a demonstration on the equipment. And hopefully we could uh, explain things to you so you don't have any questions. Or we're going to leave quite a bit of time at the end. That way, if you have questions, you can go ahead and ask. And we can, we can answer them for you. Uh, so first of all, um, Worcester Community Hospital has purchased the entire application of the robot, which includes total hip replacement, total knee, re uh, total knee replacement, and partial knee replacement, which can be a, a unicompartmental or a bicompartmental replacement. So with that, uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, the technology. Uh, we'll start with total knee, but it, Pretty much most of the information carries over to the hip and to the uni application. Um, but it all starts with a CT scan. And we get a CT scan from the hip to the ankle. And what that does is it gives us a 3D model of the individual patient's anatomy uh, that we can use to more specifically size and position the implants based on that specific patient. And that's important because one, one of our goals is to achieve what's called a mechanical axis, uh, which is an arbitrary line from the center of the hip to the ankle. And we can plan that with these models so we can position our implants on these models before we even get into the operating room and have an idea of what we're going to do and size them and place them exactly where we want them. So then we, we come into the operating room, we calibrate our machine with our patient's anatomy so that they match up with our monitor. And then not only are the implants where we think they should be, but now we can actually stress the knee under live data collection and achieve what we call a balanced knee. When we say we want a balanced knee, we're talking about the <coughs> tension of the ligaments on the inside and the outside of the knee. We don't want them to be super sloppy on one side or the other. We want it to be nice and firm, and we want those spaces to be symmetrical. So we can gather that data intraoperatively before we make any cuts based on the model that we have prepared, and we can manipulate the implants on the computer to change the balancing of the knee before we even make a cut. So if it's loose on one side, we can rotate the implant or shift it in one direction or another so that the knee is balanced. We want to balance the knee in extension and in flexion. And using the striker implants, the striker implant has what we call a single radius design so that if it's balanced with the knee straight and with the knee bent, it's going to be balanced all the way through range of motion. So before we make our first cut, we gather that data, we position the implant so the knee is balanced, then we bring the robot in. We bring the robot into the operating field and we use the robotic arm to make our cuts on the patient so that our implants fit exactly within a half a millimeter of what we planned. So some of the benefits of actual the robotic arm is that it can make those very precise cuts, number one. But number two, it gives us a field of what we can actually cut so that we only cut within the margins of the bone, so we can't accidentally cut outside those margins, so we don't need to use extra retractors, which minimizes damage to soft tissue. We don't need to dislocate the knee as long to see what we're doing, because the, the robot won't let us go past that boundary, and we'll demonstrate that to you. Then once we make our cuts, then we're, we're removing the, the robot, we put our implants in, and then we can check what we did. And if we need to make an adjustment, we can go back and make very um, precise adjustments to our cut with the robot. Previously, we would base our implants on templating, and then what we thought it should be, and then when we gather our data intraoperatively by feel, if it wasn't balanced, we'd have to do soft tissue releases to make it balanced. 
So instead of doing those extra soft tissue releases, we can manipulate the implant to get that same balanced knee. So that's, that's the benefit on the knee application. And the same thing goes for a unicompartmental knee, where we can precisely plan where we want the implant and make it balanced and get that knee that feels more of like a natural knee. Now with our hip application, the benefits are a little bit different. We know that implant positioning of the hip is very important, particularly the cup. If the cup is malpositioned, we know there can be increased rates of failure, dislocation, and we know that we can, we're can we not perfect on limb length. But with this machine, we can plan. Now there's, there's kind of like a target range where we, we know the cup should be about 40 degrees of inclination, about 20 degrees of antiversion, but not every patient's anatomy is that. Every patient is a little bit different. So we can look at your bony model on the CT scan and mimic what your anatomy is and replicate that with this machine. Also, with leg lens, we can determine are we a little bit, are we one millimeter, a hair long, are we two millimeters short, and we can adjust that based on those measurements during the surgery. So those are some of the, uh, the highlights of the technology. Um, I think I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Widmer and let him talk about some of the patient benefits. Can you guys hear me, or do I need a microphone? Need the mic. <laughs> All right. Okay. All right. So when we're talking about new technology, he explained to you kind of what our advantages are as a surgeon, but we also have to ask what answer what questions are we trying to answer here? Uh, and the questions come from a knee replacement, right? How what are we do? How is this technology making a knee replacement better? Well, traditional knee replacement has a 20% dissatisfaction rate. When we look at different studies across um, things called um, registries, which are where countries have gathered this data on a regular basis, look, the people who report it say about 20% of people who have a well done knee, based on our surgeon's exam, uh, still were unhappy with it. It feels unnatural, um, maybe it aches more than they were expecting. So part of that is maybe we don't set our expectations right, but how can we do the surgery better to decrease that 20%? All right. Um, for partial knee replacement, early failure rates. When we look at that, the 10-year failure rates are kind of high when we look at um, man, or when we look at how we put them in by hand. Okay, and so we're trying to figure out how can we make those last longer. And then for the hip replacement, dislocations, leg length discrepancies, early failures. Those are the kind of answers that we're looking for. And so when we look at the studies for total knee replacement, we can see uh, that patients surveyed six months after surgery do feel like it's more like a normal knee. They're more comfortable, and they tend to have better range of motion. When we look at the registry data on partial knee replacements, we can see that the tension <coughs> failure rates are dropping when we're using robotics. And this is related to better implant placement, better surgical technique. And what this means for you as a patient is that I can now offer more of you partial knee replacements. And partial knee replacement is actually a better surgery in the right patient because that means you get to keep more of your normal knee, it's going to feel more natural, and you're going to like your knee better. You're going to be able to get back to activities better. It's a smaller surgery, which means you can uh, get back to things quicker, okay? And then for hip replacement, no one likes it. They come out of surgery and that their leg is long on one side, all right? So if we had, can have better accuracy during surgery, we're going to improve that patient satisfaction. There's some studies that show that it feels more like a natural hip for patients. And so those are the kind of things that we're trying to address with this technology. Um, I have a little bit more, I have a hand out there with a little bit more thorough talk. Um, I, I posted that on my, my Facebook page as well as my YouTube channel. Okay? So these are things that we're trying to do. Now, the bottom line is what does that mean for you, the patient? That means that we can use a CAT scan to make a surgery that is customized for you, all right? Not just based on your bone. There are other implants that might have a you know, custom shape or something like that, but this particular surgery is customized to you. Meaning we have your CAT scan, we have your bony anatomy, and we have how your ligaments work. And if we don't know how your ligaments work, we actually can't plan knee replacement. So this gives us the advantage of anything else that's out there on the market, give you a more natural feeling knee for hip replacement. All right, do we have any questions before we get into the demonstration? Yes. Partial versus total. What is your final line 
red line that you got, that's going to be determined partial as opposed to total. What makes you say that? Well, for me, if there's certain criteria that we have published that we know partial knee replacements will fail. Uh, one of them is if you have moderate arthritis in another compartment. Uh, also, if you have a flexion contracture or a fixed deformity or a lacking in ACL, we know that those are risks of early failure. Now, if you have isolated unicompartmental arthritis and the rest of your knee looks good and you have full range of motion, then you can be a candidate for a partial. I don't know if Dr. Wimmer has a... Yeah, so in the office, what I look for is, does the rest of your knee look healthy enough? Right, and we know that the um, we can accept a little bit of arthritis behind your kneecap. So, and also, can I make your knee straight in the office? So if I can make your knee straight, and sometimes I'll do that by just checking you in the office, or I'll check an x-ray. And, and in the x-ray, I'll actually go in the x-ray room with you, we'll try and straighten your knee out, we'll see how much that inside, normally the inside part of your knee is the one that wears out the most, we'll see how much that worn down part of your knee opens up, and then while we're doing that, we'll look at the other side of your knee and see if it closes down. If it looks like we can restore the alignment of your knee or make your knee straight again, and uh, the, the rest of your knee looks healthy, then we'll go with the partial knee replacement. So if you have a ball of arthritis, which I have, I mean, it's a huge one. When you look at the knee, it's, it's enlarged big time. So uh, what do you do with that? As opposed to the other knee, because it, it has, as well, a big ball of arthritis. And as opposed to, so it's going to be total, total, or total on one yeah, part yeah. or another? I, I've seen it where it's really bad in one compartment and the rest of the knee looks really good. All right, so it would really depend on what your x-rays look like. And without looking at them, I couldn't really comment on what you'd be best for. Okay. Next question. Yeah, how long is the incision that you make compared to looking at regular pieces? The incision for me, it hasn't changed. Um, on this demonstration here, we have different arrays that we use, and we this model shows the array in the femur. We I actually use the array inside the incision, and I don't need to make the incision any longer. Uh, I still use this array on the tibia, which is a very tiny little extra two stab incisions for that array, but then otherwise the incision is the same. And, and do you still have to put a tourniquet over the knee? You, you do not. That That is a surgeon preference, uh, whether to use a tourniquet or not. Um, so it, it is not required, but you can do it either way. So I still use the same size incision. I make it only as big as I need to do your surgery appropriately. So if you call that minimally invasive, that's what it is. It's only as big as it needs to be to do your surgery. Um, and then uh, as far as uh, the tourniquet, I still use a tourniquet. It allows me to see your, your, your knee very well during the surgery, minimizes blood loss, and minimizes the risk of transfusion after surgery. Um, typically, the tourniquet's up for 45 minutes, and then we're done. Uh, the one thing that this has allowed me to do from an incision standpoint is we use less cement, so there's less problems with cement afterwards. We're able to press fit more, uh, and I do think that um, now, I've seen patients be more comfortable using press fit. I think it's related to how hot the cement gets and how that can affect your bone. One of the other benefits I forgot to mention is uh, oftentimes we will use what's called intramedullary devices, which are rods that we put down the canals to place our jigs when we use manual instruments. And we don't have to violate the canal with this robot. So we don't use those rods anymore. So there could be less bleeding from inside the canal by not doing that. Now is this an outpatient surgery? Yes, we do a lot of outpatient surgery with the robotics at this point. So I'll probably do one or two outpatient surgeries a week. It doesn't have to be. We, we typically will keep you overnight, um, but it could be the same day. I will repeat the question. Like Dr. Kanapik in Absolutely. We have Dr. Kanapik here as well, who's also Mako certified surgeon. I think I know about half of the people in this room. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm Mike Kadabic and welcome. I've done about a thousand tournaments to try this way and about 10 robotic knees. And, and, and in my short experience, I've seen a big difference. We did have a question. 
Yeah, do you put a nerve block in? For do we put a nerve block in? So we really haven't changed our protocol in terms of nerve blocks or spinal anesthesia or what we do intraoperatively with injections around the knees. So we, we haven't changed that. So I do use a nerve block. I think everyone here uses a nerve block. Standard protocol right now at this hospital is the nerve block. The nerve block is nice because it gives you about 16 hours of good relief. So that first painful night it gives you good good night's rest and allows you to get that first day of therapy in. And we've lowered the nerve block from a femoral to an inductor canal, which is a little lower, so we don't get the motor loss of the quad, so you don't get that buckling right after surgery. It's more of a pain control block. Question? Is there anything different in infection uh, risk? Is there any difference in infection risk? There is no documented difference. Some people might worry that because we're bringing this machine in, there's a higher infection rate, but there's no documented difference. And we have a 0% infection rate this year, last year in this hospital. That's talked cool. about a freezing of the nerve at one time. Yes, sir. Is that something that we still do? Or? That is something that I still perform. It is a procedure where we stun the nerves around the knee um, for 12 weeks. We do it in the office. It's a 30 minute procedure. It's been shown to lower post operative narcotic use, improve range of motion. So, that is an optional procedure that we still offer. Yes? Um, do you think there would be a decrease in the possibility of either the upper or the lower implant loosening of the knee? Is there a decrease in the upper or lower implant loosening of the knee? So, in the partial knee replacement, with better alignment, there's greater longevity, means less loosening of the implant, it's gonna last you longer. From the total knee replacement, we don't have the, the long-term data on the end. But we know that a well-balanced knee uh, should last longer than a, a not well-balanced knee, and this what, allows us to balance it. One of the things it's allowed me to do is do a lot more, we call press fit knee replacements, meaning that we're not using cement, uh, and hopefully that biologic fixation where the bone grows into the back of the implants uh, will last a lot longer for people than, say, traditional cement and implants. And I found that as well, since we're not using the intramedullary rods, I feel that the press fit implants are sticking very well, and I'm tending to lead to a cementless knee as well. Yes, sir. Are there any physical activities that you will be restricted from doing after you've healed from this uh, knee replacement surgery? Are there any physical activities that you're restricted on doing after a total knee replacement? Um, from my, this might differ, from my perspective, I, I tell people uh, the last thing they're probably going to feel comfortable doing is kneeling. Uh, and if you do kneel, I'd recommend you wear a knee pad because we do thin out the thickness of your patella. I wouldn't want you to come down hard on your knee. Um, but in terms of other activities, I don't recommend jumping and running activities, um, because, particularly with cemented uh, components, um, because you can cause loosening after repeated high impact activities. But besides that, I, I don't have any restrictions. I'll let the other surgeons answer it. Yeah, I'm the same way. The analogy I use is just bought a new car you can either park it in the garage and polish it every Saturday or you can drive it um, a lot of my younger patients choose to drive it they got a new replacement because they couldn't be, be out and active so they're gonna be a little more active I just warned them that hey if you're gonna be active and do high impact activities we're probably gonna be back in the OR sooner than we want to be and what is sooner well hopefully not sooner than 12 years but my goal would be to you know, 15 to 20 years okay right but with these Newer designs with the cementless components, when the bone grows into the implant, and with the, the um, new polys uh, over the last few, few years, we know that the wear rate is much lower and the, the risk of loosening over time is, is much less. Okay, so let's, um, we're gonna do the total knee application on with the robot. So we've already got our CT, we've already placed our implants and sized our implants uh, how we think they best fit this patient. And then the next step, which we've already done here, is to do some points so that the robot and the computer know exactly that the bone matches our model. So once we've done that, um, we, we do our balancing of the knee. Um, 
Alright, so to balance the knees, what we do, we, we've already shown the, uh, the uh, computer where everything's at. Okay, so now it knows where the phone is. The CAT scan is loaded in the computer. We've shown the um, computer where the bone is at. So now it takes that CAT scan and it marries it up to the bone. And now we have to show how tight the ligaments are. Alright? So there's a couple of different ways to do that. Um, probably the most common way is to get something to kind of wedge. We don't have anything like that. All right, the, uh, the ligaments apart. And what you'll do is you'll show how tight those ligaments are here in front of them. Let's try it here. So right there, you can see, let's go ahead and capture that. All right, and then if we come into extension, we're going to go ahead and make sure those ligaments are nice and tight on either side and go ahead and capture that. Yes? Yes. Alright. So, we're going to bring the knee in extension and my MPS, Rick over there, is going to go ahead and kind of capture those numbers. So we did that already, okay? And so, see, this person's probably a little bit bow-legged. So what we want to try and do is go ahead and get those numbers so we have a nice rectangle. Right now we're kind of there, we're on one side, we have eight, 17 millimeters and 18 millimeters. So if this person's a little bit bow-legged, we know that maybe they like to be a little bit bow-legged. Maybe if we just leave them a the little bit, one or two degrees of bow-leggedness, they're going to actually feel a little more natural. So let's go ahead and have Rick uh, put that uh, tibia in one degree of varus. And there we go. So we're pretty close to 18, 18 there. And that's something I'll accept, okay? Because I know that I open it up in one millimeter inflection. We're probably within a half a millimeter there. But what I'll do at this point is maybe do a little bit more of a soft tissue release once I'm done because if they're in varus or bow-legged, then we know that the ligaments on the inside of the knee are a little bit tight anyways. We can loosen them up to make sure that their leg is nice and straight as well, okay? So what we're gonna do now that we have everything kind of nice and tidied up, we're gonna go ahead and make our saw cuts. So in order to do the saw cuts, we have to show, again, we have to show the computer where the bones are at. Let's do the tibia. No, we're we're going to take the blade out of the machine and we can still see it on the monitor here. We just don't want to make all the extra dust, but it'll show what it's cutting on the monitor. Yeah. And we're, we'll try to demonstrate how the haptics of the robot will prevent you from cutting outside of the bony window. So I've shown it where the tibia is at, and I have to show it where the saw blade is, and I have to keep walking it all. This is really awesome. that saw through a hard piece of wood, you hit that knot and it just kind of 
bucks your saw to the side. The same thing can happen, and that couple of millimeters can translate into a couple of degrees of, of, um, of uh, alignment in the knee, okay? So what we, we do now is we're gonna go ahead and run the saw. We're gonna line it up, it'll line up and it'll lock it in. All right, so once it's locked in here, you can see I can't move it up or down, all right? The other thing is that if I move the leg, you see the saw moving with it? So it's, it's, it's lined up. And now when I moved it out of the boundaries too fast, it stopped and let go. So we'll line it back up again and we'll show you. Oh, it doesn't make any noise this way. Yeah, so, <laughs> so what we're doing here is we're, we're slowly working across the bone. And what we can't do is we can't go outside there. Okay, On the other side of that green line is where the ligament is. All right, and I, If I cut that ligament, your, your total knee is, is not going to be a successful total knee. All right? So before, what we had to do was put a whole bunch of retractors in the knee. And those retractors, while they protect the ligament from getting cut in half, they did damage to that, that ligament as well. So now we can put less retractors in that knee, causing less of that stretch, and hopefully that translates into less pain for the patient. So, the other thing is, so if I'm kind of working in the back here and somebody bumps the table, the saw won't go, but it'll actually shut off. All right, if it gets something that happens so violently, it isn't very common, but it is a nice safety mechanism. So you can see, not only is this better for you as far as being able to plan the surgery and execute the surgery plan, it's better for you from a safe standpoint as well. There's a safety mechanism in there that protects you as the patient, especially in the total knee. Uh, application. <coughs> so we don't have a hip model demonstration here, but it's very similar. We have a raise, we have a reamer, and previously with manual instrumentation, you would use sequential reamers, meaning you start small, you get larger and larger, and with each ream, you know, human human error, sometimes that, that cavity can become a little elliptical. With a single reamer, one in, one out, we get a much more concentric ream to the pelvis, and we get a better fit and press fit of our implant into the socket. Uh, so that's another benefit of the hip application here. And again, we can, we can see our implant on the monitor if we like where it's positioned, execute exactly what we want and we can again confirm leg lengths before we put in the actual implants we can use our trials and check them and get within less than a millimeter of accuracy. Um, any other questions now that we've done the demonstration? Question right here. Can you get both knees done with the robotic surgery? Can you have both knees done with the robotic surgery? And short answer is uh, yes. Uh, you can have bilateral knee replacements. Um, now, any comments on doing bilateral? I don't recommend them for, for my patients because I think uh, with um, staged implants, with this well, with our quick uh, rehab protocols now, you're better off uh, getting it done separately, and your recovery time is probably pretty similar to if you were to have them done at the same time. It's just such a big hit to have them done. Plus, it's more risk. Uh, and I don't, I don't see the reward. So you take a little bit more risk on, and it doesn't seem to make it. Well, it's that's my sister. Did. She got one knee done, and 15 years later, she finally got the other one done. Yeah, right. And by that time, she had medical problems. Yeah. So my sister and I did cars both at the same time. Yeah. Yep. It, if you exercise one, you might start to exercise two. There's pros and cons <laughs> of doing it both ways. I, I kind of in camp with Dr. Whitmer. You're under anesthesia twice as long. Your risk of blood clot for two major joint replacements goes up. So if you're willing to accept those risks, then it can't be done. Yes. There's a question right here. Is insurance coverage uh, equal for this as for the traditional surgery? Is insurance coverage equal for this as for traditional surgery? And yes, we do get a prior authorization. We do get it approved ahead of time before we go to the OR, and it has been our experience not a problem. In the last year, I have not had anyone denied from robotic surgery. Yes. Are the implants and the equipment by the same manufacturer? Yes, so at this hospital, we will 
usually use a striker implant, and that is really the only implant for the VACO system. Um, is there storage still used? No. Well, the unit is for storage, but it's owned by Stryker. So, so Stryker is the only implant that can use be used with this robot, and that's what we use anyway before this robot came. Yes, ma'am. It depends on what kind of work you do, and I think um, how labor is. If you, if you can. <laughs> Dr. Kanavik, why don't you chime in? <laughs> <laughs> that depends on if you work for me or for someone else. <laughs> but usually what I can tell people is about three months. Now, depending on what kind of work you do, you might get back shorter. But the average is about three months. Definitely for laborious jobs, I would say three months, and sometimes sooner. We, we like to tell you the, the longer end, if you go back sooner, you might be happier. If you stay in for any prolonged period during the day, you should plan on three months. It takes about that long for the bone to remodel, get used to the new stresses. Even at three months, if they're going to stand for eight, six, eight, ten hours a day, your, your legs are going to be tired when you're done. All right? If you have an office job, it's as soon as you get off narcotics. If you want to drive, if it's your left leg, it's as soon as you're off narcotics. If it's your right leg, it takes about six weeks to get the break time back. Uh, if you, I've had patients who, after hip replacements, uh, are back to work within four to six weeks, depending on what they do. The replacement usually takes longer, all right? Uh, but again, if you have any standing, you'll, you'll probably be able to do each individual task at your job before three months. But to tolerate doing it for that long of a time, it takes time to get used to that. And so that's why the three months is what we really recommend. <laughs> what is the age criteria? I can tell you from my experience, uh, I don't really don't have one. It's more of a medical, uh, if you're healthy, I've done 90, 92. Um, so it really just depends on your health. I don't know if any of us have an age cutoff. Yeah, I mean, I have patients in their 90s and I have patients in their 20s who have hip replacements. Yes, ma'am. Is there a weight criteria? Is there a weight criteria? So, um, if you look at things like weight, we look at more specifically not the weight but the body mass index in terms of complication rate, in terms of infection, in terms of failure. So it depends if you are a younger patient with a high BMI. I do have a cutoff. Um, of around 40 BMI. Uh, however, if you are going down and you're showing that you're, gonna lo you're losing weight and your BMI is expected to continue down, then we can, we can work with that on an individual basis. Yeah, I mean, my algorithm is that based on the resources we have here, um, I do not offer anyone with a BMI over 50 surgery. Come with me first time and your BMI is over 45, we won't discuss surgery, we'll discuss weight loss at that visit, okay? The goal is to get some, there, there are controllable risk factors and non-controllable risk factors. If you have diabetes, we can't control that. That is what it is. If your diabetes is out of control, we can control that. We're gonna get your diabetes under control before we do surgery. If you're overweight, that's something we can control, all right? And so I will encourage my patients, There's a, we have a very uh, long discussion and we'll offer different strategies on how to lose weight and I'll try and walk you through that all right if I'm not successful for the first six months at least getting you to lose some weight then there are other resources uh, in bariatric programs dietary programs things like that that will get you enrolled in because the, ultimately the reason people come into the office is because they're losing their mobility their independence their function their individual <coughs> activities of daily living the goal is to get that patient to be able to have surgery but we don't want to do surgery while your wrists are high. If your BMI is over 50, you have a 20-fold increase in having a major complication, infection, blood clots, loss of life, MI, things like mit, uh, my heart, or heart attack. Okay, So those are all things that we have to take into consideration uh, before we take you to surgery. Question. Do you have an A1C threshold? A1C threshold. Another, another risk factor for infection, high sugars. Um, we, again, based on an individual basis, watching trends, 
try to get people below 7.5 to 7 is our... If you have it over, if it's over 8 at this institution, you can't ask for a Yes? What about lifestyle risks? Smoking, drinking, etc., etc.? That's a good question. Yeah, smoking does increase your risk of infection and slows wound healing. I haven't used it as a litmus test for uh, surgery, though. Uh, we'll have a discussion, but it's not a reason for me to, to not do surgery at this point. Uh, there are surgeons around the country who won't, um, because it is a significant risk factor for not only infection, but stiffness after surgery. And um, alcoholics, uh, people who drink a lot of, who are alcoholics, tend to be malnourished. So we will work on your nutrition before we go to surgery, if that's the case. Yes. You guys keep saying younger patients, what does that mean? Well, we, we, you can get arthritis at any age. So what is young? You know, someone in their 40s, we would consider young. Uh, someone in their low 50s, we would consider young. Uh, we've, we've done them in lower age groups like that. Um, however, we want to make sure we've exhausted uh, our other treatments first. In my mind, young means that you're looking at more than one hip or knee replacement in your life, okay? So the goal is that this is your last surgery, you replace your knee, and you, it lasts you the rest of your life. So some patients who come in with post-traumatic arthritis, early arthritis, things like that, uh, they might be in their 40s. And that's young. 50s is, is fairly young because if this implant's going to last you 15 years and you're in your, your 50s, most people live past their 70s now, okay? So you're looking at, so to me, that's how I define young, is someone who I think might have to have more than one surgery after I do that replacement. So not this We won't comment on that. <laughs> Questions? Yes? How does a patient make a decision of whether or not to have surgery based upon whether they want to do it now and think of that in 20 years, or they want to delay it, or what? How do you make that decision? How do you make the decision if you should have it now or have it delayed 20 years? Uh, it's really a, a, an individual discussion with you and your physician talking about what options there are, how bad your symptoms are, uh, what have you, you tried and failed, and it's really a, an individual decision in other comments. I think there's just a couple questions you have to ask yourself. One, does it, can you do the things you need to do on a daily basis? Is it painful to get dressed, go up and down stairs, right? Are you missing out on things that you used to enjoy, all right? Uh, are you able to sleep at night? The answer is yes to two out of those three questions, and you're probably at the point where you're going to start to consider surgery. And the final one is if you've tried everything else, and you're down to either taking a narcotic or addictive pain medicine, or having surgery, I would recommend surgery. The pain of surgery is temporary. Addiction can be a lifetime problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the pain part is the main criteria that I use is is your pain, liberty, your function. So when that happens, then it's probably time for, for surgery. But most people are going to come in and say, okay, it's time. A lot of people, we know for, for years that they, they have arthritis and we treat it, treat it with medication or injections, and then eventually it gets bad enough that it limits their function, and then we do a surgery on it. Now therapy is awesome, and we got three good doctors here. Now I'd like to hear from each doctor, what is great therapy to you guys, and what's the uh, intensity of it, and the exercise, and what's the duration? So. Are great therapy. Uh, well, we start therapy, like Dr. Whitmer said, day one. And we we want to get a normal gait. We want to have a strong quadriceps. We want to get range of motion. First six weeks, the most important thing to me is range of motion. I think your gait and your strength will come. Range of motion to me is important to get within the first six weeks. If you can't get it by six weeks, you're going to have a lot harder time getting it. If you don't get the range of motion by six weeks, I'm very quick to pull the trigger on the manipulation where we give you some sedation, bend your knee and straighten your knee to get you back on track. Because after six weeks, if you're going to do a manipulation, two months, three months down the road, the risk of 
rupturing a tendon or a fracture when you do the manipulation goes way up. So you got six weeks in my eyes to get the motion, and that's really what I, I stress. I mean, the early goals are range of motion. As soon as you get your range of motion, you're building strength. Um, I think that uh, the, the key, the thing that I like to see is, um, and, and I've been able to see in my practice switching to uh, robotics is that, you know, I like it that six week mark when I see that patient back in the office, that they are ready to wrap up their physical therapy, right? And that's really my goal for each patient. You come in without a cane, you have 90% of your range of motion, and you're working on strength, you're getting that last 10 degrees back, and um, we say, look, one or two weeks of therapy, get your home regimen and go from there. Um, that's a knee replacement, hip replacement. A lot of my patients are coming in at six weeks with an anterior approach, um, and uh, they're done with their therapy, no cane, no limp, a little bit of stiffness in the front of the hip, uh, and if we do a quick check in three months. So, um, and as far as specific exercises, um, to be completely honest, I'm not gonna be able to give you the specific exercises, um, but really, like, like uh, Dr. Bruce has said here, it's really about getting that range of motion early and then hammering at your strength after that. We know from um, studies that it can take really a full year to really for some people to get that strength going up and down stairs without alternating feet. Right? Some people it takes two years. Um, but the goal is that you know, by that six week point, you have the majority of your motion and you're off a of cane. What about swimming? What do you guys feel about swimming? After six weeks, I'd love for you to get in the pool. I send a lot of people to, to aquatic re, uh, rehab. Uh, I think it's really good for patients who aren't good surgical candidates yet. So someone asked about obesity. One of the first things we'll do is start aquatic therapy. It takes the strain off your joints, allows you to get some exercise, uh, and it's been one very successful tool that I've used. So I like water. I don't let you get in the water for six weeks after surgery, just let that incision heal. After that, you can swim all night. <laughs> <laughs> so when I trained him, which is many years ago, go, I had an old surgeon that said, said physical therapy is for failed surgery. Mm -hmm. Now I don't don't believe in that. I I think therapy is a important to get your strength and reach your worst back, but it's individualized. So some people, if it takes six weeks or three, three, three months to get your strength and motion back, then that's what it takes. And I have other people that in two weeks, they got their strength and motion back, and that's what they need. So I think it needs to be individualized. Does anybody have other questions about the technology? Yeah. Well, thank you to all of our surgeons that yes. uh, are willing to come in and talk about this technology, and I hope you